When President Reagan was elected back in 1980, he ushered in an era of small government conservatism. In this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. The era of big government is over. If we want America's job creators to do what they do best, we need to get government out of the way. Freedom and free enterprise are what create jobs, not government. We need to cut spending now. So please, send us some spending cuts. Free markets work. The president's cut taxes. He's rolled back regulations. Yep, that's right. The prevailing belief was that government should stay out of the economy as much as possible. Even the 2008 financial crisis and the massive state bailouts that followed that didn't shake that core belief about how the American economy should be run. But is the COVID pandemic and the economic crisis it's caused set to change that? Breaking news, a record shattering 6.6 .6 million Americans filed for unemployment benefits last week. Americans are doing what they've been told. Businesses are shuttered. People are staying indoors. It's just kind of been a struggle ever since the pandemic hit for me to keep a roof over our heads. The reality is we're not going to get the kind of help from the federal government that I think all of us need. So where does that leave the millions of Americans, mostly old school Republicans, who still believe in small government conservatism? Well, I am going to be researching my third party options. Ramesh Panuru is with the American Enterprise Institute, a Washington based think tank whose stated mission is, amongst other things, to defend the idea of limited government. Neither the Republicans nor the Democrats do it for him. So he's looking further afield. There are small independent uh, candidacies, whether it's, you know, the Libertarians or the Greens, the American Solidarity Party. And these function really as kind of protest votes where one is declaring himself in favor of a different kind of politics altogether without thinking that candidate is actually going to win the election. I vote in Virginia, which is a state that is uh, practically guaranteed to go for Biden. And so that does create a certain degree of freedom. So who do small government conservatives, you know, the traditional Republicans, who do they vote for? Well, I think that most small government conservatives will vote for Trump anyway because he has been an anti-regulatory president and an anti-tax president. And the uh, Democrats are proposing so much spending that the contrast still works out in the Republicans' favor. But I think it's a very pessimistic time for small government conservatives that there isn't really a champion. They haven't got a home, basically, have they? No, not at this moment. Of course, that can change. And there will, I'm sure, be attempts by Republicans who are more traditional to try to wrest control of the party back after the election, particularly if Trump loses. So what is the dividing line, do you think, between the two parties now? It's a period of flux, and so we're gonna, <laughs> so it's hard to say. But I do think that we continue to have a politics that is polarized around the social issues. You see Republicans who are, are fleeing Trump most are the more socially moderate Republicans. And the Democrats who have come to the Republican Party under Trump have tended to be more culturally conservative. So the division's not so much over economics anymore. And that's one of the reasons why you don't have the kind of small government, big government divide that you used to have in American politics. Right now, there's a deadlock in Washington over what level of support to continue providing for people during the pandemic. Why is there this deadlock? Coming up to the elections, you'd imagine that the government would be quite keen to keep voters on side. Well, there are Republicans who are under the impression that the economy is recovering quite nicely and that Democrats want to bail out irresponsible Democratic state governments. And there are Democrats who think that the Republican proposals are too stingy. Now, this seems like the sort of thing that would lend itself to a compromise in the middle. And yet our political system at the moment does not appear to be generating that compromise. You know, nothing in our political system at the moment seems to be rewarding people for working together. What does that mean for the elections if nothing moves on this and this deadlock is not resolved in Washington? Is it dangerous for President Trump to go into the elections without being able to promise support for people who are still struggling 
in the midst of the pandemic and havoc it's wreaked on the economy. So if no deal is reached, the Republicans will go into the election saying that they tried, but that the Democrats obstructed them. And that is a message that I think will work for Republican-leaning voters. I'm not sure it's going to be enough for people who are not particularly partisan and are just unhappy about their situation. Unless, of course, the Republicans are lucky, and all of us are lucky, and there really is a very strong economic recovery over the next two months. One thing that people are getting confused by is just the seesaw pattern of the economy. We are now in a situation, I think, where you can have very strong positive numbers that still mean we've got a very weak economy. And I think that's such an unusual situation. It's, it's one that's been hard for people to adjust to. This year has already seen some of the best and some of the worst economic numbers in U.S. history. And it's important not to lose sight of the big picture, which is that this is an economy that has sustained very serious damage. Ramesh Panuru of the American Enterprise Institute, all of which means that Bill Clinton's famous catchphrase, it's the economy, stupid, may not fly this time round. But given the sheer number of people who've lost their jobs since COVID hit and the businesses that have had to be shuttered or closed down, why isn't the economy a bigger deal right now? A Gallup poll in August showed just 12% of Americans thought it the most important problem facing the country. It's something the economist James Galbraith at the University of Texas in Austin has been thinking about. We've got 30 to 40 million people who are out of work. So uh, it's surprising that in this election, it's not a bigger deal than it is. And to what extent is that because perhaps the full economic effect of the pandemic hasn't really been felt yet? Well, I think that is a major reason. We had in April a major influx of income support for people. We had the $600 a week unemployment insurance. We had the payroll protection program. We had the stimulus checks. That assistance has now expired. And so we're going to see people coming into distress in the months ahead. It doesn't take a lot of foresight to see that. But that hasn't happened yet. But that's going to hit then in the next couple of months. I mean, if this next package that was supposed to support people is not come through Congress and the Senate yet, then that's going to hit now, isn't it? It is going to hit. The other problem is going to hit is that for the moment, the ban on evictions and foreclosures remains in force. But when that eventually expires, then the conflict is going to arise between people who've got massively accumulated arrears on rents and mortgages that they don't have the resources to cover. What's the difference at the moment between what President Trump and what Joe Biden is proposing in terms of dealing with any economic fallout? Well, my impression is that the administration has now taken the view that once a vaccine is in place, that the economy will simply come back on its own. And I think that's not going to develop that way. Vice President Biden and his team, they're basically taking their cues from the experience of 2008, 2009. And their view is that they can provide the economy with a certain extra boost, a stimulus in the short run, but they're going to have to then retrench over a period of years following. And I think that also, while it's a better program than the administration's, it's also not going to solve the issues that we're going to face because they're fundamentally the economy is entering a kind of structural crisis and many different aspects of it are simply not going to respond to the treatment as well as they did after 2009. So what exactly is different this time around? Could you spell out what the differences are? Okay, so first is in the advanced sectors, the American economy serves the world. And a major example of that is civil aviation, aircraft industry. You can put money into Boeing to keep it afloat, but you can't revive its market that way because that's a worldwide market. And if people are not traveling, airlines are not going to be buying new planes. You can think about the oil industry, which you may or may not like. It costs about $60 a barrel to lift oil in Texas in the Permian Basin. And the oil price is $37 right now. So it's not going to be making it over the long run on those terms. And think about things like office building construction. We've learned that a great many of those functions can be performed by people working at home. So those offices are not going to be filled and the people are not going to be building new ones. All of these things are just long-term problems that are not going to go away simply on the basis of a stimulus program. And then you think about where the jobs are in the economy. It's not in the manufacturing sectors, it's in services. And those jobs are very, very interdependent. That's to say, my willingness to buy your service depends upon my having an income, which means I, you have to be willing to buy mine. There are two issues here. One is the pandemic itself has really 
really cut into that sector. And restaurants and bars and lots of things are closed and things that are open can't operate at capacity, which means they can't cover their costs. There's a second problem, which is that millions of people who are in these jobs are aware that their situation is precarious. So they're going to mean cutting back on their use of other people's services. Uh, they have to have confidence that the whole situation is going to return to normal. And it's very clear that it's not going to return to normal. And the third problem is that people's debt payments, their rent, their mortgage, the utility bill, the phone bill, their student debt, their health care debt, all of that continues to pile up. And ultimately, there's going to have to be a reckoning with this enormous structure of debt, or we're going to have waves of bankruptcies, foreclosures, evictions that greatly exceed those that we saw in the 2009 debacle. And the situation will be very different because then you could make an argument. People did make an argument. Well, those people shouldn't have taken out the mortgages in the first place. And you can't make that argument in a public health crisis. People are staying at home and foregoing their incomes in order to protect everybody else. If you say, okay, at the end of the day, you're going to lose your home, that's going to lead to a situation where there's really hell to pay in the economy and the society if we go down that route. You're basically saying throwing money at this problem is not going to resolve anything. You need a strategy. You need something detailed. I mean, that's something that Joe Biden has put forward. He's been speaking about a Green New Deal, something that would re-engineer the whole American economy to address climate change. Doesn't that address some of these issues? Well, the Green New Deal, I I hope that Biden does embrace it. I don't think he's embraced it very clearly at this point. It would, in fact, repurpose a great many of the most advanced and competitive resources that the American economy has to do something that's socially useful. But those jobs that we're thinking about transforming the energy system, for example, they're outdoor jobs, they're important jobs, but you're not going to bring the economy to full employment on that basis. And that's why you need to have, on the one hand, a job guarantee so that people can say, okay, look, even if I'm not going to be employed in what I've customarily been doing, I can find work at a decent wage doing something useful. And then you need some system in which the service sector can continue to operate some help with businesses to cover their fixed costs because a profit-oriented system works pretty well in an ordinary expansion. It won't work when everybody is trying to cut back on their use of these services. Can you see that happening though? Can you see any government from January next year being in a position where they can put in place that level of intervention in the economy? I mean, it's just unprecedented in America, isn't it? It's just anathema to the way American economy has been run. Not at all unprecedented. I can point to three historical periods, 1861, the start of the Civil War, 1933, the start of the New Deal, 1941-42, the start of the Second World War, in which the country really was called to restructure itself to meet an enormous challenge, and did. Obviously, it's a struggle when you're facing with a political class which is divided between those who want to do nothing and those who think it's adequate just to cut taxes and raise spending in order to kickstart the private economy. That's adequate. They're going to be disappointed. And if they're disappointed, maybe they'll change their thinking and get in front of this. Economist James Goldberth. So is America ripe for a new way of thinking about how the economy should be managed? Julia Azari is professor of political science at Marquette University in the U.S. It's hard to predict because people did expect that out of an Obama government, that this would be exactly as you said, kind of a sea change, kind of a move away from the Reagan era. And it wasn't entirely. I think a lot of people are kind of skeptical of Biden as that kind of transformative leader because he's been in politics for so long. He's so affiliated with the establishment. But do you think this election could potentially be as significant as, say, Reagan's election in 1980 or the election of Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal back in 1932? I think there's a possibility for that. And that's where I started sort of thinking about, well, what matters beyond the president? Because I don't know that those types of figures are always obvious at the outset. FDR is especially instructive here because he really wasn't an ideologue. You know, he really wasn't a firebrand for fundamentally rethinking the economy. He was someone who took a lot of different kinds of advice and took office in a time of profound crisis and ended up really reshaping the institutions and the way that people thought about politics and the role of the government and the economy. Even then, even in the 1930s, there was significant pushback and there were limits on what Roosevelt could do to really reshape those institutions. And I think now there's even more. And there are a lot of forces in American politics that are very powerful and a lot of organized interests that 
aren't committed to kind of fundamentally reshaping the economy. At the same time, I think there's going to be tremendous political pressure around the environment, racial justice, and also around student debt, which is a huge factor for younger people. But I think that it will look more like these kinds of policy adjustments in what appear to be discrete issue areas than the, the sort of ideological sea change of the Reagan-Thatcher years. Ultimately, though, what matters is what the voters have to say and, and whether the way they realign will force any change through. What do you make of that? And who are the voters who are most interesting to watch in this election? Yeah, so that's a really fascinating question. And I think it's tricky because the electorate in the United States is so divided by race, by region, by age. I think that if I had to guess who the most interesting voters to watch will be, it would be people in very competitive states who voted for Trump last time. And then I think what everyone will be looking at is the suburbs, particularly college-educated women in the suburbs, looking at how this gender and diploma divide might deepen in American politics to create a more durable Democratic majority that has not emerged over the last couple of decades. Julia Azari of Marquette University in Wisconsin. Well, it certainly promises to be a momentous election. Voters across the political spectrum in America agree that many things in the country are broken. The question is, who should do the fixing? Today's producer was Lawrence Knight. Lawrence Knight.